Doug Keck here with Bookmark on location at the Catholic Marketing Network, joined by Dr. Bill Thierfelder. Welcome. Hey, Doc, Doctor. Great so to much see you again. Me. It's yeah. been a while. Uh, a new book, less than a minute to go, and it's the secret to world-class performance in sport, business, and everyday life. Forward by Coach Mike K. And it's great to have you yeah, here. Yeah, thanks. And uh, it's been a while. You know. You've been at EW10 in the past, but it's been a while. Now you're yeah. at the, what, Belmont Abbey? I'm president of Belmont Abbey, and okay. going into my 12th year, which is well, very hard to believe. Explain what Belmont Abbey is. Just, you're not a monk or anything. No, so. but I'm an oblate okay. uh, of the monastery, and we have uh, a Benedictine monastery there, and obviously, in, in Catholic education, that's an important... But it's actually a college, right? Oh, absolutely, right, yeah. It's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a regular college, liberal right. arts, small liberal arts college, right, Catholic right. college, but the, the Benedictine tradition of 1,500 years that 1,500 years of building and preserving Western civilization mm -hmm. is something that we've continued in the tradition there. Uh, Abbot Placid Solari is just a wonderful, holy, mm -hmm. brilliant uh, monk and abbot, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very blessed to How have him. How many students are actually at? Uh, total with our adult degree program, about 1,700. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Is that more than it used to be? Has it expanded? When I first or? came, we had about 500, so I, it's, I it's, grown, it's grown quite a okay, bit. So you've, yeah. you've, You've used some of what you've learned from world-class performance to improve things? Yeah, well, we, I, I trust the Holy Spirit. Okay. You know, we, we cooperate with God's grace and look what happens. Right. Forward, uh, Coach K. Uh, Dr. Bill Therfelder is one of the leaders whose lessons and thoughts on the subject I value and appreciate. He has an unparalleled understanding of what it takes for an individual to turn his or her peak performance into their standard. As a leader and a mentor to athletes, he knows exactly how to be the kind of leader who can help people develop that standard. How did you learn how to help other people? How does one learn how to be a coach? Well, you got to always attribute first any gifts you've had. I'm a steward, so anything I've been given, I've been given from God, so I'll start there. I also think it helped that I had a, a, a tremendous family, my mom and my dad. I think my dad bought every tan book that was ever published, okay, and so right, right. had given those to us all through our lives. And so I, I think just so the you were formation. Catholic growing up yes, then. Okay. and I had a really strong formation. And so I think the combination of that with whatever gifts or skills I've been blessed with mm -hmm. uh, enabled me to work with people and help them to improve their performance. He also says, I also appreciate the way that Bill talks about expectations. What way is that? To live in the present moment. Mm -hmm. In other words. Well, you sound like Mother Angelica. Well, it's, it, right. well, she's right. right I mean, right, you know, right, all, right, all I can reiterate right, is everything she's right, ever said. Probably, right, you know, I'd right. be in good shape if I did that. Uh, but the present moment. Um, there's an interesting thing about the present moment. In in world class performance, the way that you perform at your best is by being focused 100 percent of what you have. There is no 110, by the way. Mm. There's no secret slice yeah, under pie. Yeah, I noticed pie. you said that. I need yeah. 110 percent. There is no 110, there's yeah. 100, okay? And if you put the whole 100 into what you're doing in the present moment, only on what actually it takes to perform, that's as good as it gets in performance. Right. Now put another thought with that. All of time is present to God. He's got no past, he's got no future. So mm -hmm. to the degree I remain in the present moment is the degree I remain in perfect union with God. Mm -hmm. So if I ruminate about the past or I get anxious about the future, I've left him. I get distracted then. I get distracted. I lose my focus. That's right. Okay. So when you think about it then, sport, whatever we're doing, carpentry, whatever you might be doing, if you're completely absorbed in it, giving it all, everything mm -hmm. that God's given you, doubling those talents, you're in union with God. He's there with you in that present moment. So there's not this disconnect between sport and, and life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's all one. And so to the degree we can remain in that present moment is when we are going to be closest to God and we'll be doing the best that we possibly can for Him. Now, is this the kind of approach that one can uh, succeed better in business? Is it a way for a person to become a better Catholic or Christian? Is it a better way to be able to overall integrate your life together? Absolutely. I mean, we, we tend as human beings, I think, to break things into boxes. Mm -hmm. So we put them in compartments. You know, over here we're going to do some physical, over here we're going to do some mental, over here we're going to do some spiritual. You and I right now at this fraction of a second are body, mind, and soul, right, right now, I mean, at a nanosecond. So to not address those three things all at the same moment, all of the time, we're missing something. We're, we're falling short in some way. Mm -hmm. And so certainly from a Catholic perspective, we believe that we, we have been blessed to know the fullness of the truth, and we seek that truth mm -hmm. in everything that we do in each present moment. Right, now right in the beginning, of the, you used the famous example of the famous Hail Mary. Yes. Okay, and it's the Flutie Hail Mary. Right. Because uh, there have been some others at different times talking yes. about Hail Mary. But the, and this is the one I thought was interesting. With determination and purpose, he stepped toward the 37-yard line and threw a Hail Mary pass into a 30-mile-per-hour. I didn't realize. Yes. Went on a headwind. Yes. The Miami defenders anticipated it, but that was the problem. Right. They thought about what should happen rather than seeing what was happening. That's what right. Do you, what do you mean? Well, think about, you know, when we talk about reality, 
that's first of all humility, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the recognition of reality, of truth. Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they anticipated, they thought what was going to happen, and I think all of us in our lives tend to do that very often. We, we sort of try to anticipate and say, oh, it's going to be this way, and then we're shocked when it doesn't turn out that way, because right, right. God has a good sense of humor sometimes right, right, and presents right. us with things we never would have thought of. Right. And so that's really what that story was about, is to say, if you actually paid attention to what was happening, and I go back to the present moment, if you paid attention to what was happening in this present moment, you would have seen what was happening. Right. They would have been in the right place. They ended up being in the wrong place, but I guess for uh, Gerard Fallon it was, and, and Doug Flutie and right. DC, it, it was the right place. They threw the pass longer than they thought it was going to 63 throw. yards. Right. And he's 5'9", five, five, I think, you know, 170 right. pounds or something. Right, exactly, and you're saying also into that kind of a win. But then you, you, you get a little educational on me. You start quoting Aristotle. Yes. You say, excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted right. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. That's right, and, that, and that's true. I think sometimes when we say these words, virtue, it sounds good. I don't know that we always know exactly what they mean. And it's really the habit of doing good. It's living you know, a virtuous mm -hmm. life. And it, that means doing certain things, right. acting those out. And what's very interesting about bringing Aristotle up is that when we talk about sport, a lot of times, and this has been my, my experience, and I've spoken now to probably millions of people on sport, especially Catholics, mm -hmm. you get one of two extremes. Either you, you have a group that says, well, yeah, I don't like the immodesty and the foul language and the, you know, all the bad stuff associated with it, but you know, what are you going to do? That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And then you got the other extreme that says, I'm just disgusted by the whole thing. I don't want anything to do with it. And I'm saying both positions are untenable. Mm -hmm. We've got to take this back and make sport what was intended to be. And as I began to look into it, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. Plato in 386 BC said, those who change the sports are changing the manners of the young. Plato recognized the power of sport. Everybody I just listed, St. Francis de Sales, St. Augustine, beginning of a quote, when I was a boy I played ball games. I don't know about you, I don't think about St. Augustine playing ball games. Right. And yet he was talking about when he didn't properly direct sport, what happened to him. He allowed pride to take over, his pride in winning and so forth. And so he was showing what can happen if we don't properly direct our, our attentions virtuously when we're dealing with sport. Well, also, and you talk about right in the beginning this kind of quizzical response you got from the retired players at the NFL Players Association when you asked them about uh, how many of you during your careers were trying to perfect the intellectual virtue of art? And of course they all, you know, like most they people stared say, at me. Uh, <laughs> you show you at the right conference. Right. Explain what you mean. Well, what I wanted to get across to them is that, again, we're in a culture and society today that has come to accept that sport the way it is is the way it is. And so mm -hmm. with all the vice that goes with it, we say, well, but you have to have the best performance, as if somehow world-class performance and virtue are mutually exclusive. Of course, they're not. They, they go together. And so what I wanted to convey to them was first to shock them a mm -hmm. little bit, because I wanted to get their attention. Right. And then the second part I asked them after asking them, you know, how many of you are trying to perfect the intellectual virtue of art? I said, how many of you are trying to perfect yourself as football players? Mm -hmm. Whole room raises their hand. And I said, that is the intellectual virtue of art. It's the right method of external production. Whatever you're trying to perfect in your life, that's that one virtue. But as we both know, virtues don't work in isolation. They, they work right. together. And that's what you I was trying to convey to them. And of course, by the end, I think they got that. Right, you say, however, art is only one of the virtues. Virtues do not exist in isolation. Right. You need prudence, for example, in order to have fortitude. Otherwise, you will tend towards one or two extremes, cowardness, and recklessness, and one of the things the church is always talking about is the both-and approach That's to exactly things right. and, and that yes. middle way. Yes. Right. The other thing you mentioned is, but while sport can be a great way to grow in virtue, the culture surrounding sport can often make cultivating some of the virtues like temperance, modesty, humility extremely difficult. And if you think about today, probably worse than I've ever seen it before, right. in many ways professional sport leads the way in aggrandizing the vices of pride, anger, envy, sloth, greed, gluttony and lust as its most prized Also icon. known as the seven deadly sins. Right, exactly. You know? and, and what's really unfortunate about that is that I've worked with hundreds of professional athletes and I would tell you that if you met them, you would love them. They're, you know, the NFL players I worked with were great fathers, husbands, Christians, I mean, great, great people. You just never hear about them. Right. All we hear about is the disaster stories, everybody right. who's cheating and doing bad things, and that has had an effect on the entire culture. Mm -hmm. And then you see at the college level, you then see it at the high school level, mm -hmm. and to be honest with you, we even see it at a youth level now. Right. You see it with the parents in the stands who are jumping up screaming about someone who, you know, are dominating somebody and crushing them, um, and they're cheering about that. I right. mean, there's something very wrong 
with the way that we're looking and understanding sport. It's really become really a selfish work is the problem. Right, you know, uh, well I was thinking myself, that one thing I felt good about, I, I could always tell, uh, I guess my football coach that I was, I was praising the Lord every time I was dropping a football. <laughs> uh, yes. How am I supposed to do that? You say, to, I encourage them to say, thank you Jesus. Right. Why? Well, two reasons. I mean, first of all, this is a world-class wide receiver, okay? Right. So if he drops a ball, and by the way, just to prelude to that, he said a very bad word yeah, when he dropped you. that he ball, cursed, right? right, right. And, and, I, and I said to him, you know, what did you say? Mm -hmm. And he kind of looks at me a little sheepishly and says, well, I, you know, I dropped the ball. And I said, I know you dropped the ball, but I said, but what did you say? Mm -hmm. And he kind of again looks at me and says, well, I dropped the ball. And I said, thank you, Jesus, right? And he kind of looks at me like I've hit him over the head with a two by four. And he says, well, why am I thanking Jesus? I dropped the ball. And I said, well, aren't you thankful in all things? That's 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Mm -hmm. I said, it's all things, right? And he kind of looks at me and says, yeah. And I said, so thank you, Jesus. And he goes, thank you, Jesus. And I said, good, come on back. Now tell me what happened. Of course, he came back. He couldn't tell me what happened because at the moment when he could have actually been aware, what was he doing? He allowed pride to take over. Mm -hmm. That's what the cursing's about. That's what the stomping in the ground is. I have to show you how good I am. See, I don't drop balls. Right. So I told him what I it see. was. He didn't get his head around, okay? He didn't, right. he didn't snap his head. I look like I have a tick, but that's how right, fast right. you can turn it. So he goes back out, 10 more balls or so, he drops on the ball. He's about to say the word, he turns around, he looks at me and I kind of say, eh? and he goes, thank you, Jesus. I said, good, come on back, I'll tell me what happened. Right. This time, he was able to tell me, you know, it was what you said, I did not get my head around. Right. So there were two reasons. First one was the virtue of gratitude. It was the right thing to do. We should be thankful in all things. Right. You know, bang your head, thank you, Jesus. Drop the coffee in your lap, thank you, Jesus. Oh, okay. You know, win the lottery, thank you, Jesus. I mean, it's all good. Sound this, like Deacon Bill, he used to do that all the time. I know, but it's true, you know, it's true. And so, so that, that, that's the first one, that's the higher argument. But the second one is purely pragmatic and applies to anybody that's in anything, sport, right. work, whatever you're doing, and that is this, you can't change what you don't know. And so for him, if he dropped that ball, it was for a very specific reason. And since he didn't know what it was, there was no way of changing it. So by actually saying thank you, Jesus, you've given thanks, it's the right thing to do, and then you've also allowed yourself to be able to be aware of what actually happened, which gives you a chance to change and improve. And not get consumed with trying to cover up That's right. the fact that you made a mistake and, yeah. and by getting the end mad of, at yourself, yes. and down by the, on yourself. By right. the end of the day, this guy, first of all, is a better person physically, mentally, and spiritually. So we didn't have to say, hey, let's pray just after it's over, but during it, it didn't matter. By the way, he was making catches at the end that could be on like the uh, on a newsreel. Uh, right, they're they're right, incredible right. circus catches. If he ever dropped the ball, he could be 50 yards away from me, and I'm hearing him screaming at the top of his lungs, "Thank you, Jesus!" Right, you right. know, and he comes back. So my point is, he was a better person that day for doing that. And I would challenge anybody. So everybody I've ever spoken to and have brought up the "Thank you, Jesus," that has been life changing for so many people. Mm -hmm. It's a, such a simple prayer, right? Right, right? Whatever's happening in your life, thank you, Jesus. Should be your first response. And like St. Teresa, if you do it in the small things, right. when the big things come, you'll be better prepared. And does it help you keep your focus that way? Completely, yes. Right. It gets yeah. you back into what you're actually doing, and back to right. that task at hand. Right, exactly. And I say, the point of this book is to achieve peak performance to the best you can be on and off the field. Uh, you know, some people today, and I was thinking about sports and what you're talking about, and I think about how, uh, you know, here we are living in a culture to some degree on one level, on the pro level, and even going through high school, we're treating these kids like they're they're supposed to be professional athletes, right? And we're we're idolizing them and aggrandizing them, and the, and the more wild and crazy they are, and more obnoxious, the more press right. they get, and that's what's important to be pressed. At the same time, we have schools where everybody's a winner, where there is right. no competition, where almost the idea of competing is looked down upon. The idea that well, if there's a winner, then there has to be a loser, and we right. don't want anybody to feel bad. How, right. how do you view that today? I would say I go back to stewardship. So if we take Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the talents, each was given according to their ability, but each was asked to do the same thing with it. And so as we know the story, you know, the one who got five doubled it, got mm -hmm. 10, the one who did two got four. The one who had one buried in the ground, and of course he gets thrown out in the darkness where there's a wailing and gnashing of right. teeth, okay? There's something in that for us to understand mm -hmm. about what we're called to. So I would say this to you, winning and losing, first of all, they have nothing to do with winning and losing. Whether you're going to win or lose has nothing to do with it. It has to do with what you did. So by being absorbed, again, back to the present moment. I mean, that is such an important reality. That's where God is, that's where we should be. If I am in the present moment doing the best that I can do, first of all, that's as good as it gets. Doesn't mean I can't get better in the future. Can't, I can't I can go back, dedicate myself to improve. But right now, that's as good as I can do. 
that will either have me win or lose, however you want to look at that, but I've done the most with the skills, talents, and abilities I have, and that is what we should be focused on. It should be the higher argument. You know, very often, the act of contrition, there's two reasons we're sorry. Mm. First one is we want to avoid the pains of hell. Right. You know? But the higher argument is I love you, God, so completely. Mm. I want to be with you and I am sorry for doing this because I love you so much. Mm -hmm. That's the same kind of thing we should be approaching you know, our activities with, our sport with. This, this lower argument of just, well, it's the winning and losing kind of thing. That has nothing to do with what we're called to. Mm. So I'm, I'm hoping that people will come to recognize that, number one, I've never met a person not satisfied if they've given their 100%, knew it came out, that couldn't live with that, even if they right. didn't get the result they want. And also, I think the opposite is true, which is I think there are people out there who know they're not putting out, they're not doing good, and they get some award and they say, well, it doesn't mean anything anyway, because right. I know I'm not good at this. But we go back to formation, what you said earlier. You said these really like elite kind of players. Well, what happens to them? They have no form, they have malformation. They're treated the wrong way. They're given the wrong message. Um, and to be honest with you, that's why we get to a large degree the visual of vice right. attached to world-class performance. And, and then we almost the say they have to go together. And some of the acting we've seen by many, you yeah. know, sometimes the college superstars, you know, where you're, you're starting to wonder these people act like if they can do right. anything. And by the way, we can change this. Right. There are tens, millions, if not hundreds of millions of people thinking like we're thinking about this, but we all feel like we're alone. We all feel like we can't do anything about this. It's like this. being a Catholic in general. Yes, <laughs> it really is. But you know what? The Soviet Union did this. They put, what they did is they put a spy or an informant in every block and every building. So even though you lived amongst millions, you felt very isolated alone because you didn't know who you could trust. trust right. To a de large degree, the media today has tended to do that to us. It's isolated us. So each of us say in our homes. we lost our privacy. Absolutely. And we all feel like in our homes, well, like we're the last remnant. Mm. It's just us. Right. Well, look at this program. Look, look at this and network. That's what EW10 is all about. That's exactly right. right. And right. it's reaching you know, hundreds of millions, right? Right. So right. if we would all come together and say our expectation mm -hmm. is still world class performance, but we want all the other virtues that go with it, right. I guarantee you we could transform the world of, of play, of well, sport. Well, St. Paul talked about finishing the race, right? That's right. Right, exactly. This was, I thought this was interesting in chapter two, running on empty. Why does the win fade so quickly, leave you feeling like you've lost or didn't win enough? Why is it that some athletes can't walk away from the game? And, and you mentioned several here. Many other famous athletes desperately try to return after their first final goodbye. They're desperate for the approval or the love of others. Their reserve has run out and their tanks are empty. They need a refill. So that's, what they, that's what's been fueling their, their, yes. their lives. And I'll tell you what, I've never met an athlete that that didn't apply to. It's more of a matter of degree. Right, right. And what ends up happening, it's a, it's a bizarre thing that gets tied together, but being good enough gets tied to being loved. Right. So when I do good, I get the clap on the back. When I don't, and, and I'm so desperate for this love, that I'm willing to almost do anything. And by the way, that's when we start to get into things like drugs and cheating, and because mm -hmm. then the end justifies the means. In other words, I've, I've got to win, I've got to make the money, I've got to be famous, I've got, I've got to, to be powerful. I've got to show that I'm still that, that's where right. everybody thinks I am or I thought I was. Well, that was interesting too. Let me ask you a minor thing. You Did you, and maybe you just clap on the back. Yes. I always think of get people getting a pat on the back. Do you use clap for a different reason? Yeah, I mean, a clap is a little bit more forceful. Okay, okay. <laughs> a pat could sound, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking it's a big clap a big on the clap. back, okay, you know? And, right. and everybody feels really good when you get that, especially, I guess maybe I'm thinking of athletics. Athletes don't tend mm. to pat on the back, they They'll, tend to clap you on the back, you know what I mean? You smack I, you, I've been right. hit by a few football players, players some big right. guys. They, they you don't know? pat you, right? I've never felt like a pat. They hit uh, you pretty good. Yes. You say a very successful NFL player worked I work with, made millions of dollars, owned three Mercedes, two palatial homes, and could be just about anything he wanted. When I first started working with him, I noticed that he would go out almost every day to the mall and buy a shirt. Yes. Yes, a shirt. Even though he was a Super Bowl champion, his tank was nearly empty. Yes. And you could see that with some people, which they need to do something every day, yes. in a sense, to reinforce their, their worth that yes. they've got, right? Yeah, and, and we've talked a little bit prior yeah. to this about the media mm -hmm. and the bombardment of information on us. And all of that keeps this frenetic pace going where we don't ever have the quiet and we don't ever reflect on what's true and where we're going mm -hmm. and what our purpose is. It almost tries to keep ourselves busy. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is, St. Augustine talked about it. He said, if you don't have first things first, if you don't mm -hmm. have God first in your life, then money, power, fame, pleasure all have the potential to become addictions because right. you will never have enough of them. Right. And so he was going out literally buying a shirt. I mean, it sounds like an odd thing, right. but he would buy a shirt because it was something to do and it was something to get and it was like a momentary little right. satisfaction. It's a reward. A, a little reward or something. But 
it, it was empty. Right. So he bought the shirt. Now he's back to. Right. He's I got, got nothing. And he's either giving them away to people. And he has everything. Or he's got a closets and closets yeah. full of them. This was another interesting point you made. You say you may think that an NFL player, especially a young one, is continually being taught and coached. This is rare. There is a mentality preferred pervades which says you are the pro. We pay you a lot of money. To perform. Go perform or get off the field. And you, and you talk about in the book really that transition from mm -hmm. in a sense of the more the college to the pro right. where the reinforcement or you take guys who were superstars in high school but suddenly they're on a team with all superstars yeah. or superstars in college and everybody's a superstar right. and how the reinforcement isn't there. Yeah, it's also like a pyramid. Mm -hmm. As you go up in the levels, it's getting to be smaller and smaller numbers. So the stars in high school, you know, they stand out because they're the stars. But now when you get to college, those were all the stars. Right. You know, right. now there's stars among stars, and then you know, to go from college to pro is even even smaller. And so right. it, it keeps getting kind of crunched down as you move along, and um, it, it, it tends to emphasize the wrong things. Say here, the intensity of the hurt or anger you experience when you're told that you do not measure up in some way will be proportional to the intensity of your need for each drop of love. Yes. It might explain the outrageous behaviors of so many athletes who completely lose control of their emotions during competition. I know you mentioned here Serena Williams, and then you even flesh back to John McEnroe. Right. Well, again, I go back to that, that tank. I mean, it's the, the mm -hmm. illustration of an idea that we're, 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 we're made for love, and we're trying to fill, be filled with love, and again, if we don't have our focus on God, if we don't have our focus on the right things in our life, we're going to be trying to fill it up with something that can't go in the tank. Mm -hmm. Money, power, fame, pleasure, they, can't, they, don't, they don't fill up the tank. Right. And so the tank gets emptier and emptier as you move along because you're not getting these claps on the back anymore. Mm -hmm. You're getting very few of them. And again, when you get to a pro level, money is it. I don't care what they say. I don't care whether they sound like they're doing something for a moral reason or not. They're not. They're doing it for money. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And everybody is geared that way. So right. you get to And that's how the teams run it, and that's how the coaches Absolutely. run it. It's all about yeah. winning. And if you don't succeeding. recognize that going into it, right. you're in trouble. Right. Uh, you, you're going to get burned out. And that's where you need that support system, too. Yes. And that's where faith comes in. You need some spiritual direction is right. what you need. Let me ask you a question. Sometimes it's surprising to see with some of the football players and stuff that, they're, they're, that at least on the outward side, there's a faith aspect, you know, kneeling yes. down on the yes. field and things like that. What's your take on that? It's great. I'm glad for anybody who's going to pray anytime. Right. But the problem is, I go back to this disconnect where we where we have not seen the human person. I mean, Saint, Saint John Paul II. Um, he actually created a department called Church and Sport. Mm -hmm. I went to the first meeting in Rome some time ago when that was created, which also shows you how important it was, even to to, to uh, the Pope right. and many popes and he have was talked about a it. Sportsman oh, when he was absolutely. And so the, the importance of this, what we're trying to do, and let me maybe give you this one quote if I could. It's my favorite quote on sport, and I'll tell you who it is by after I give it to you, but it goes like this. Sport, properly directed, develops character, makes a man courageous, a generous loser, and a gracious victor. It refines the senses, gives intellectual penetration, and steals the will to endurance. It is not merely a physical development then. Sport rightly understood as an occupation of the whole man. And while perfecting the body as an instrument of the mind, it also makes the mind itself a more refined instrument for the search and communication of truth and helps man to achieve that end to which all of us must be subservient, the service and praise of his creator. That is by Pope Pius XII, okay. sport at the service of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the foundation, it's what we should be doing as Catholics certainly, right. that should be the foundation of everything that we do related to sport. And I'm, when I go back to these pro athletes, that is not the foundation. That is not what they are doing. They're doing it for the wrong reasons. It's why the tank is empty. It's why the money drives everything. It's why there's a great dissatisfaction. Right. Even if maybe they started out for a different reason along the way. Let yes, me ask they you They started too. out playing. Right. And and sport is play, but when then, it when it stops being done for its own sake, play right. is like wisdom. It's contemplation really of the highest things because it's done for its own sake. Right. But when it starts now to become something like the end, money or power or fame we lose it. Well, you talk about, you know, getting, uh, having your tank empty and obviously talking a lot about athletes, but also transitioning to people in their normal everyday lives and workplace. You talk about somebody saying, coming back and saying, I need a vacation from my vacation. Why do people do that? Because again, we think we got to fill everything up. And so we're, we're out and we're racing around and we're searching for the things that really don't so give us leisure and relaxation. So when we have a chance to rest and relax, we end up doing things. Right. 
I mean, Thank you've been you. talking to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, St. Francis de Sales, of all people, you don't think he'd have anything to say on right. sport. He right. talked about it. He said it, it can become, if, if it's not done for a recreation, mm -hmm. then it becomes an occupation. Right. And that's the danger. So he says it does the very opposite of what you were starting out for the intention, mm -hmm. which is I'm going to get this relaxation, I'm going to get this peace, I'm going to get this rejuvenation, I'm going to get a clearer focus with mm -hmm. God. It does just the opposite. So we come back actually more exhausted, more anxious sometimes, right, right. and thinking, oh, how, how am I now going to go back to work? Right. Well, let me ask you, we've got less than a minute to go as okay. well here, and that's the title of your book. Uh, how long did it take you to put this book together? About a summer. Okay. Uh, this was a, by the way, I get nothing from this book. Everything okay. goes to support Belmont Abbey College. Okay. Um, my family helped me do this because okay. I would have never done it otherwise. I was kind of tricked into it, but I... Okay. St. Benedict Press. St. Benedict Press, which has been wonderful. By the way, they've donated everything to the college as oh, well. So really? Okay. Everything goes to Belmont Abbey. So uh, after going through this experience, are you going to write another book, or what do you think? I'll, I'll leave that to God, okay, and uh, yeah, if yeah, an yeah. opportunity opens itself, That's we'll say sometime. You'll, 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 but my hope in this book was it's got to be a model. And so at Belmont Abbey, that is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And we have now coaches that are teachers and mentors first, where we have an oblate, a Benedictine oblate is our soccer coach. And he's okay. inculcated that into it. But that doesn't mean we're just praying out there and that the, the, the participation doesn't count. All of it counts. It has to come together, right. Yes. Let me ask you one question before we go. Yes. What about sports on Sundays? especially youth sports. Yeah, I, we, we try to stay away from it completely. Right, right. And I would recommend, as a matter of fact, I would say that from a Catholic perspective, we got to bring sport back to the parish. Okay. The traveling team thing, we go into a long talk about that, okay. I think is insane. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's tearing up families, it's disrupting family it's life. A, We've got to get back connected to the church. Check the local parish. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Dr. A pleasure. Bill, thank, Bill thanks, Felder, Doug. I appreciate uh, for stopping that. by less than a minute to go. The secret to world-class performance in sport, business, and everyday life by a world-class person himself. Check it out, available from the EW10 Religious Catalog.